Okay, Big Brother is recording. Yeah, yeah, this is a, a new era here. Um, so welcome to uh, our April uh, Canandaigua Lake TU meeting and our first ever monthly, our first ever hybrid meeting. We're at the uh, American Legion Hall in um, Canandaigua and we're also live on Zoom. We have about 10 people in the room. <clears throat> here at the uh, Legion and uh, let's see, what are we up to about four, oh, another dozen or so online on Zoom. So, uh, and um, have a really good friend uh, as our guest speaker, uh, Kirk, who's also the one who's helped us uh, with all this new fangled high tech stuff we've done. And they've, Kirk is from the um, Twin Tiers, Five Rivers uh, FFI chapter in uh, Corning and um, He's been like a role model for our chapter to, uh, especially uh, in this new age where we've had to learn how to uh, multitask here at our meetings here. This is um, actually our first meeting in this room in over two years. The last time we were here was in February of 2020. And uh, so it really feels good to be back. I mean, it's been, we've been going month to month to try to, okay, is it safe to meet? Is it safe to meet? And uh, these, you know, positivity numbers go up and down. And um, so about a month ago, we said, okay, I think we can go for it in April. And um, so um, uh, so here we are. So uh, this is quickly what our um, agenda usually is. Uh, we've opened our door. We had real and virtual doors today. So uh, here, here again, and um, everybody time you hear that beep, that's someone else uh, signing on in Zoom. Uh, so we'll do our, our usual uh, opening with the pledge, uh, go through some fishing reports and photos, uh, some general updates. Um, Al will give his uh, conservation update, which is uh, gonna be pretty extensive today. Um, and we'll talk about our survey and um, our intro to fly fishing school. And then we'll uh, hand off to, um, to our guest speaker, Kirk who's the one in the picture with a really nice looking uh, steelhead. So, um, so we, uh, all right, so let's, as we usually do, um, let's uh, raise our, remove our hats and repeat the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I, Still one works better in person than it did. Sure does. Yeah, we we get like the you know, yeah all the sorts of feedback, and it's also nice having a flag in back of us. That's a a nice uh, little touch here we can have. And um, and hey, please you know in your thoughts and prayers the, the brave men and women of Ukraine who are just I mean it's just the I can't believe it in the 21st century we're witnessing such a horror. But um, you know just pray this ends soon. Um, okay, so we always uh, like to show off uh, some pictures and we got some uh, snowbird pictures. And uh, so I thought I'd lead off. I finally got uh, down south into the, some sun and a couple of weeks ago. And uh, this is my brother, Paul and I, we went uh, fishing near uh, St. Petersburg and uh, doubled up on redfish. We actually caught these in about Oh, like a 10 seconds apart there, we hooked up on, on these two. They were, they were actually too big to keep because uh, the slot limit on reds and the guide we were with actually netted them on the same scoop. He <laughs> netted one fish and, and netted a second one and we and was able to kind of hoist uh, this in. So just, yeah, it was a big net. They were really, uh, it was about 10 minute fight to get each of these in. They just would, you know, ran the drag out and. Uh, really awesome. And then uh, my brother got a nice, uh, we caught some snook too. And here's a. So your fish is bigger than your brother's. It's fun. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but he caught it first. So he, so anyway, it was a real good time. Um, so it'd been um, actually, yeah, years since I'd been in Florida in the winter. So that was fun. Uh, let's see. Okay. I have not, I'm not going to. Um, so let's see what else we got for fish pictures. We had a couple, uh, Mike, this one you sent us, that's a, uh, hammerhead shark. And then, uh, that's Jim drone with a speckled trout. 
So uh, you've sent some other ones to us also. So uh, another beautiful day down there. So yeah, a big grin on Jim's, Jim's face there. Um, okay, so here's some more local uh, fish. Here's uh, from the uh, one of the Great Lake Tribs, big steelhead uh, Scott sent us. And then uh, this was a uh, brown from uh, Lake Ontario trib uh, that one of our Facebook uh, fans, uh, Eric, uh, sent us in there. He had some really good luck. Um, so uh, the tributaries are probably, you know, when the, if the levels are, you know, allow, um, uh, this can really be a, a really um, fun time in the early spring for some really big trout in some of these tribs, especially the steelhead. And then, um, Tyler is who is our most photogenic member. <laughs> he always sends some great pictures. His big carp. He claims he caught on a three weight, um, and 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 didn't break the rod. I don't know a three weight. You know, look at that thing. And then um, one of our other Facebook friends uh, sent us this. Uh, this is uh, uh, actually from Canadagua Outlet, uh, which was stocked recently. So it was really nice. Looks like two year old brown he caught out of there. So. Um, I tried to fish that stream about a week ago, but it was way just really high water. So fishing up with your belts or something? Or he didn't say where he was. I, I fished in Schwartzville. So that's <clears throat> that's a really underrated stream in our area and, and a beautiful if you've never been there. Um, but just just so everybody knows, I kind of looked at maybe trying to do something to really kind of some improvements on that stream, but the DEC kind of advised mm -hmm. against it. They say it's just not, it's just so marginal with the trout stream. Yeah. They figure we'd be wasting resources and wasting time, but so <laughs> I did look into trying to that'd be a beautiful location for the trout stream. Yeah, it's real accessible and it's uh, close, but it warms up in the summer. Yeah. And they become, but it's a really good bass fishery, actually. And I love going there and like, Last spring, uh, when I was up there, and uh, I walked up to one of the bridges, and a guy had about a 16 inch brown that was carryover. Yeah. You know, and I thought, um, they used to say that about the Cohoctin, that there were no carryovers in the Cohoctin, and that's not true. No, that's not true. I have to wonder if you know, there are places. Oh, yeah, there. I'm sure there are, but their their assessment is that we could spend a lot of time and money and not get much benefit out of it. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's kind of cold in the spring and then it warms up quick. So, but um, let's see what else. And then okay, uh, and this is our trout stocking. Um, we had a lot of really. This is uh, from the two sessions on the twenty uh, fourth of March and the eighth of April, and uh, we had well, two different schools come right. The Marcus Whitman and the Cohocton right. school children help us out and. Um, a lot of volunteers. It's funny. It seemed like people were just kind of showing up, you know, uh, like they would see what we were doing. And like this fellow with his uh, son here, I think just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we went down there about 30 yards. I suspected a couple of them, but we kept an eye on them. Yeah, but um, yeah, really fun event. Yeah. Yeah. They'll take off with the back. Well, a guy had, <laughs> I had, had that a backpack one. and he came up and said, well, let me carry one of them buckets. And he went down. He and went he, down. He went kept down an eye on them. The sheriff's property. He was sitting there kneeling and he was taking one fish at a time out. Yeah. I, and this was one of the places I decided to go away from the truck and put one in. I go, don't handle those fish. And I don't know if you can get the <laughs> backpack right next to it. So I don't know if I need oh, to God. Yeah. Yeah. He, was, he was picking them out. Yeah. And there were fake people fishing. Culling, culling them. Yeah. Even yeah. on uh, 24 marks, there were people fishing as soon as we saw Oh, them. yeah. 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 We had uh, yeah, a couple of them there and uh, with their big spinning rods and stuff. They were, they were there last Friday, too. <laughs> but nevertheless, I think a lot of fish were. How many thousand fish were? It was. Uh, well, we put about 8,000. About 8,000 uh, so, so far. And we got two more days. Between the two stockings, about 30. 3,400 something in that neighborhood of one year old rainbows. But those rainbows had a great variety in size from six inches to some close to 16. Okay. And then, and then we had about 400 two year old brown trout. Okay. Well, the six inches are paid for. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so everyone who did uh, come down, it was a, a good time, was had by all. And thanks to, you know, for helping improve that.
The best thing about, uh, about the helping with stocking, I find, is if you learn the river, you learn where to park, and you want to learn, uh, okay, I put, <laughs> I put a bucket over by that tree there, so I'll note to self there. Um, so uh, let's see. Let's uh, a couple other things. I'll um, actually I crossed out. I usually a lot of times I talk about our Facebook page, but I'm I'm want to kind of revisit this uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, we have what's called a public group, and unfortunately that means that anybody in the world can join our Facebook group. They changed the security setting about a year ago, so we get literally people from all sorts of countries, you name it. And a lot of them are trying to, you know, running some kind of scams or, or things. So we're constantly doing kind of this whack-a-mole game to, you know, sift out the, you know, the people. So um, we're thinking I'm uh, changing it to a private group, which gives us more control. And also you could be a little more, you know, open because it's kind of more of a closed uh, community. So, uh, well, speak to that but uh, so that's why i it's still i think a valuable resource although uh, i think we get more impact from our newsletter and and other things just out of curiosity how many people in here even use facebook uh, so three four <laughs> you know so about half the crowd here and um but yeah some of the novelty of it is beginning to wear thin with with me just because of the people who have abused it um but we still um once we sort that out, it is a good place to um, uh, put, um, you know, fish pictures. That's where I pull a lot of these out of. And, um, and, uh, and also, uh, we're recording this meeting as we've done since we started doing Zoom. So we put that on YouTube. And uh, so if you miss our meetings, you can always catch a replay of it later. And uh, we got some uh, really good um, views on that. This one down here was last May, and Al did it presentation on the Cohocton River and it was it's probably even more than that now but it was 280 or so people have watched that since we uh, posted that this was a couple of months ago so it's probably over 300 maybe by now so um, it's a it was um, and it was pretty easy compared to some of these other things we do um, if you want to get a hold of us um, we have on our new website a contact link and um, so that's working really well it sends an email uh, out to us, and uh, we've really made some good connections uh, with people. Uh, one of the projects Al will talk about was someone who reached out to us through that uh, that venue. So, um, and here's where I, I kind of pass the plate. But if you want to help us, uh, none of this software is is free. Some of it is, but most of it we pay for. So uh, we also have a donation link if you want to help us uh, pay for these licenses. Um, I think one's about to renew our. Squarespace for the website. Uh, oh, and I forgot, is anyone new here who's never been to one of our meetings? Um, see, everyone here looks familiar in the room, but if you're on Zoom and it's the first time you've attended a Canadagua meeting, uh, just send a note in the chat and uh, we'll, um, you know, you can introduce yourself there. Um, okay, let's uh, move along here. And so this is what's coming up in the future. This is actually the last kind of meeting uh, we're doing of the season. Uh, our next several events are, uh, are outdoors. Um, and the big one coming up in May is our intro to fly fishing school at Onanda Park on Canandaigua Lake. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, how many people um, have signed up for it. And, um, also, the same day in the same park, uh, there's a, uh, a classic British car show going on from the Ontario uh, County Historical Society. So we'll be uh, that's a kind of an added attraction. And um, I saw Paul Osborne online here, but he's I believe one of the organizers of that. And uh, I don't know if this is his car down here. This is an MGB GT, but I remember seeing it. It's just a gorgeous. Uh, um, uh, restored MG uh, that Paul has. Uh, so that should be fun if you're a fan of uh, those old cars. And then um, the week after that, I was, uh, this also was contacted through um, our uh, website uh, from Dick Sporting Goods in the uh, Eastview Mall. They uh, asked if we'd like to participate in the outdoor expo they're doing on Saturday, 
uh, May the 21st. And I said, sure, why not? Uh, it's, um, so we're going to have a, a table and uh, basically, uh, you know, just answer fishing questions for people to come by. Um, this is at the brand new, that huge uh, mega store down uh, probably, I think, I think it's outdoors at the, in that uh, like soccer field area they have there. So uh, that'll be fun. And uh, so if you want to volunteer and uh, come out and visit us for, you know, then, you know, for even a half an hour or so, um, uh, please join us in May. Um, let's see, June 11th. Um, yeah, we're going to, I'm not sure if I, if I, we haven't really had time to organize this one fly challenge tournament. So I'm thinking just to have a picnic and get together and fish down there. So um, maybe, you know, have like a fish in the morning and then have a picnic in the, in the afternoon. So Andy, you have that grill, you said, right? A portable or like a good. Um... Okay, no problem. We'll find plenty of it there. So we're going to do that at the um, special regs area with the, uh, parking lot on uh, what's that? Avoca back road. Down the back road between yeah. Wallace and Avoca. Yeah, the real nice, beautiful spot, and it's off. We've done it before. Had the one yeah. yeah, so we'll uh, work out what to do there. I don't want to. Um, like I said, it'll be a friendly competition if we do anything. So, with that, um, but stay tuned. We'll uh, announce more details on that later. In July, we're going to do our bass and panfish invitational again at uh, Bowton Park in Bloomfield. That was a lot of fun last year. Uh, if you have a canoe, that was one of the funniest things we did that. I mean, we had some pretty bizarre looking um, watercraft uh, <laughs> show up on that. Uh, uh, Jerry Mecca, I mean, he came in a float tube and he was wearing shorts. And so he uh, went down in like one of the most kind of swampy ends of the lake and got uh, just chewed to pieces with uh, mosquitoes. So. Uh, if you go in a float tube, wear pants, don't wear shorts. <laughs> so that, but that was a lot of fun. And then sometime in August, we have our uh, planning meeting and then September 12th and um, all goes well, we'll be back in this room. That'll be our first meeting of our new season. Uh, usually our theme is how I spent my summer vacation, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, work on uh, finalizing that, but hold all those dates. Uh, especially the one coming up a month, um, yeah, a month from today. No, not quite, the 14th of May. Um, this is my plea for volunteers. The big uh, thing, and I'll, I'll pass a sheet around, is to, uh, if you want to volunteer for, um, hey, let me send this around the room now, for our, uh, to be a, to help out with our intro to fly fishing school, why don't you write your name? I put some of your names on there already. Um, who've, so uh, doing it all school here, passing the paper around. So uh, yeah, so we're volunteering everyone in the room. We actually have 15 students um, enrolled so far, registered for our school. Uh, so I'd like to get at least a dozen or so uh, volunteers so we can do kind of one-on-one -on -one casting. Um, so uh, yeah, mark that. If you're online, you can send me an email uh, that you'd like to volunteer at info at uh, Canada Agua Lake TU. And I actually noticed one of our students, uh, Barbara, is actually online. Uh, so um, uh, welcome to her. Um, and then these are some of the other things you can help us out with. And actually, thank you to a lot of these folks that have, have stepped up, uh, Jim Canton and John Chaldone, to, uh, are helping out with our um, membership database in um, MailChimp, which is our newsletter system. And, um, and then some of the other uh, uh, stuff we do. And and uh, big thanks to uh, Ralph, uh, who's filling some huge shoes uh, by helping uh, with Al on uh, the conservation. Okay, almost done here. I usually aim to try and finish this part in about 20 minutes there. Uh, okay, Al, you're up. Why don't I... Stand about where I am and hook this onto your shirt. And, oh, I gotta uh, get hooked up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, Kirk is our cameraman. Well, this is tough because I I don't like to stand still. Us old army guys, we don't like <laughs> we we like to keep moving. You can move. Yeah. <laughs> now I uh, we got really got a lot of things going on. I'm just going to briefly uh, talk about the crossroad project. 
that's our big project out there. We're going to put uh, nine habitat improvement structures out. We hoped to do it last summer, but the water was too high. So we're now scheduled to do it in the middle of July. But if the water gets low earlier, I want to try to move it up and do it earlier. So uh, stay tuned. Um, I also have ordered some trees, and we're going to have to put them in pots and keep them watered until we can plant them. But but that's our, our big project, and that's uh, a lot of big potential payoff for about a quarter mile section of the river. <laughs> As we talked about already, we did, we've did we already done two stockings, one in March, one April. The next one is um, 20th. So uh, I got a pretty good, good full crew, but if any of you want to join us, send me an email and I can add you in. But so far, uh, the stockings have gone real good, and we've had a lot of uh, good young help. And that's what we want to do is we try to get the young folks involved because they're the conservationists of the uh, of the future. Um, we also have another initiative uh, going on. We're trying to um, work with uh, some other organizations to uh, try to preter preserve and protect uh, Little Mill Creek, which is down in the Wayland, uh, Dansville area. Uh, we're going to try to help them. Uh, they basically want to try to uh, put some special restrictions on the creek. And I kind of designed a little sign and um, they looked at it. They think it's a great sign. We're going to be meeting with them on uh, Thursday. Uh, uh, Ralph, I'm bringing Ralph down with me so he can meet those folks. But we're going to talk about not only uh, how we can post signs and help to preserve and protect this area, but also um, they've asked uh, me to give them some, you know, some uh, suggestions as far as what they can do to improve the stream and stuff to uh, protect it. But this is basically, it's a, a brookie, a native brook uh, trout stream, and also has some wild browns into it. So it basically feeds into uh, the Little Mill Creek goes into Mill Creek, and then it goes into the Canisarod Creek, and then it eventually flows into the Genesee River. But it's a, a real nice uh, native brook trout and wild uh, brown stream. So we're going to try to help out with that. That's just part of our effort, uh, preserve, help preserve cold water fisheries. Another big initiative I kind of jumped into is to try to get uh, what they call the Mayfly Station down at the uh, Cahocton River. And I think this is a really important initiative because, you know, every time I get funds from um, any place, I have to kind of justify them. And one of the things I've been saying the last 20 years I've been doing this is that, you know, temperatures are going up in the Cahocton, uh, trout are getting stressed. And that's why we've been planting a lot of these trees. We're trying to shade the river, drive that temperature down. Uh, we're trying to do these habitat improvement projects, drive the temperature down, increase oxygenation. So I think it's really important, you know, to get this station and that'll help us uh, to get, you know, more funds in the future and justify our projects. Um, it's gonna make a big difference if I can go in there and in my request for funds, if I can show a graph that shows, you know, what the problem, what the temperature trends are, and what the temperature problems are. Like they say, um, you know, pictures worth worth a thousand words. And the other, there'll be some other spin-off benefits too. For example, for those who fish down there, uh, they could call up uh, the station and see how warm the water is in the summer. If it's too warm, you know, just not go there. Try to go somewhere where the the water's cooler. But basically there's two parts to the system. One part is a sensor uh, package that goes, we actually have to put it down the river. And this package is gonna tell us temperature, turbidity, and depth of water. To me, the most important one is, uh, they're all useful, but the most important one is, is temperature because that's the biggest threat to trout in the Cahocton River. Uh, air temperature, but the air temperature can be a little weird. Yeah. Because you got a, a unit where you get sunshine so that you get the solar, solar panel to work 
Yep. And that could be warmer than the ambient temperature in yep. the general area. So the main thing we'll worry about is, you know, temperature number one, but it's nice to know turbidity, nice to know depth, but you can look at the uh, USGS gauge for uh, depth. So we have the in-water unit, and then we have on the shore, you put uh, a pole with uh, uh, the logger module on it, and it's um, got a a solar system on it so it kind of recharges at all time and i've talked to uh quite a few people who have put these in and have worked on them and uh relatively maintenance free one guy had a squirrel chew on the cable and they had to get a new cable but other than that are uh, relatively maintenance free but um so that's a good thing and then this sensor automatically uploads the data and sends it to a central location. But then once it goes to that location, it can be accessed by many, many people. So you could pull up, hey, what's what's temperature at the Cockton? What's the trends? What's going on, whether you're with Fly Fishing International? And this information can really help us uh, design future projects. And it also can help us justify and, and get funds because you know we we really can't do much if we we don't get the funds to you know buy materials and do installations well, uh, just fyi we haven't had time to talk about this but uh, cal curtis who i was with when they put the one in on awaka was offered if we needed to come down and yeah help us install us. yeah i got several people that who have done it you know i'm I'm one of those that don't believe in inventing the wheel. I'm going to get some other people who've done it. You know, I'm working with the DEC to pick, you know, the best possible location. We got to have a location where you got good depth uh, throughout the summer. Uh, we also have a good have a good have to have a good location where we can put the the pole so it doesn't get affected by flooding. We got to have the solar panel so it actually gets sunlight. We got to try to put it some, somewhere where somebody is. Uh, less able to vandalize it and so on. So, um, of course, in order to get this, uh, we had to get fundings to do it. So uh, uh, we're going to be using some of our own internal funds, but I've also asked some of our friends to provide funds. So Kirk and Fly Fishing International have donated $500. Greg's donated, you know, $250. Uh, Mildred says she's going to give me a check tonight. Yeah. So uh, we're going to be, you know, it's kind of a, a group of uh, like-minded folks who are concerned about cold water fisheries. We're going to, we're going to put the money together. We're going to get this done. I already got with TU International. And I, uh, based on the, the input I got as far as donations, I told them I want a unit as soon as possible. And they got back with me today, and and uh, they're going to fix fix us up. So we're going to. My goal is to get this in this sometime this summer. So that's a kind of rundown. We got a lot a lot of things in the mill, and I appreciate all the help everybody uh, gives to support our efforts. Yeah, okay, I grab that for me. Your lapel. Oh, oh, give you a mic back. <laughs> I don't get to keep that. <laughs> Sooner or later, yeah. Now, this is a really interesting, and it transmits the data using a cell service. Um, so, um, and there's a, a, a website you can go to. It's pretty slick. It's got a map, and then you find where your your uh, unit is, what stream you want to look at, and um, it'll pull up all the readings there. And um, so, it's a you know pretty was pretty easy to use. I played around with it. I saw the one in Nawatka. Um, I think it was 46 degrees the day I looked at it. <laughs> so uh, a really slick piece of gear. Um, and thank you, Al, for uh, just taking the initiative on this. It's really, uh, uh, it's uh, so much appreciated. Um, uh, let's see, I'll, I'll quickly do this. We have, um, actually, I should say the April. We're doing a, a survey and uh, Ralph and his wife, Cindy, put this together. I want to run it kind of one more month to um, you know, get a little more feedback, but uh, um, so it's uh, pretty easy to use. Uh, there's only 24 questions and um, you basically kind of click through it. it, should take you, I think maybe less than five minutes, but uh, it gives us some nice um, feedback on uh, what all of you want to see us do 
and how do you basically you give us a report card? How are we doing? And, uh, and this was just some of the comments uh, we've got um, uh, so far. Um, so I like this one uh, about you know someone who's a, considers himself a new a newbie. Uh, so um, you know we have to really make sure we engage people like that. So um, so uh, please, if you have some time, uh, we're gonna like I said run it about another month and then start analyzing uh, our returns on it. Uh, and then one more thing, our May intro to uh, fly fishing. Uh, see a few people wrote their names on here. So um, I guess we, um, this is the first time we've done this since 2016, I think. Um, so um, we're starting off a little, it's going to be a, a fairly, a little simpler. Uh, it's also going to be free. Um, in years past, we used to charge uh, folks for this, but there's so many free fly fishing resources, including from Orvis, that uh, we decided uh, we would do it at no charge. Um, we're doing it in uh, Onanda Park. Uh, and if you would like to volunteer, if you'd like to be a student, uh, we still have five more seats available. Um, and, um, and if you'd like to volunteer and help us out, uh, just um, if you're online, you can email me at info at Canandaigua Lake TU, and it should be a, a lot of fun. And like I said, it is an added attraction. We've got Paul's uh, uh, classic British car show to, to watch. Um, someone asked me actually, do they need a fishing license? And uh, if we're going to actually put a fly with a hook on the, the end, uh, and you're going to try and you know cast into the lake, yeah, you wouldn't need a fishing license then. But if you're just going to cast a piece of yarn on the grass, no. But um, yeah, weather permitting and uh, time permitting, uh, what the heck, let's see if there's, um, I think they have this pier and isn't there another uh, dock down there? So it might um, yeah, actually uh, hook into something after we take the class. Yep. <laughs> and uh, like we said, we're just, it's designed for beginners, although um, you know any skill level is welcome to come. And um, after we can do some brief kind of basics, then we're gonna, we wanna get outside as quickly as possible and uh, get people uh, casting. Um, so uh, the link to join this, it's in tight lines. Uh, there's a, a registration link um, that TU uh, set up. That, that system has worked really well for us. And, um, and uh, we'll reach out to the students uh, in a little bit here just to get them all uh, set. Um, you don't need a fly rod, although if you do have one, bring uh, if you have a favorite rod, uh, bring that along. Uh, but we have plenty of rods, and um, if you're a volunteer, uh, you know please bring a you know a rod of yours uh, if you want a, one of your old ones, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, to help uh, teach folks. Um, this part I scratched out uh, that when we first were planning this in January about COVID vaccines. Uh, this is going to be a lot of outdoors, so uh, we're not, just like tonight, we didn't check everyone's ID about whether they're vaccinated or not. Um, that's kind of an honor system. Um, okay, uh, so that's our, our school. That's our May event, one of them, and it uh, should be a lot of fun to get going on that. Okay, so um, let me introduce our guest speaker, Kirk uh, Klingensmith. Um, Kirk has really become a good friend of ours, um, uh, just uh, down in Corning in the Southern Tier, and is really a role model of how to run a, a fishing club. Um, he's the uh, president of the, uh, let's see, I gotta get all this, the Twin Tiers, the Five Rivers, <laughs> uh, Fly Fishers International chapter. One of the leading chapters of, in the uh, country, right? Of, um, you know, they've really, um, um, so they've helped us uh, with this uh, hybrid setup, which they've been doing. Uh, Kirk is a retired from uh, retired engineer from Corning uh, Incorporated, and he was telling us some of the projects he's worked on, like uh, what was it, Pyrex, and some of these other uh, products. Um, so uh, he's been fly fishing for a long, long time, 52 years, and fishes for basically anything. Swims, I think, is <laughs> a good uh, thing. Here he is with a big. Bass he caught this uh, winter in Florida. All right, so uh, we're gonna do a little switcheroo here. Uh, Kirk is also a member of uh, TU, um, the uh, Leon Chandler chapter over in the Ithaca area. And so I'm gonna shut this off. 
and uh, Kirk is going to do his thing. Do you need the mic or? Yeah. Okay. Move around the camera. I'll try. All right. <laughs> I'll move around. Challenge you. No, don't do that. Not <laughs> <laughs> one of things are going pretty good here so far. <laughs> so, uh, thanks for welcoming me and having me up. Uh, there's, there's 1920 people online. There's how many around okay, the room? So 10, 10 around this room. 12 coming last It's kind of a new world, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, welcome to everybody that's online. There's, there's a few good friends who are online. <laughs> um, I, I suppose they're gonna harass or ask tough questions. Um, and uh, before I get started, I want to thank you for all you do, uh, especially for the Cohocton watershed. Uh, but thank you for all you do for cold water fisheries. Uh, been aware of the, your club for a long, long time. And uh, we've, we've been uh, at different ends of the Cohocton, if you will. Uh, but uh, we, we love that fishery and we're glad that you have invested so much in it. And uh, we're Glad to be able to help uh, with this particular project and kind of embarrassed that we haven't uh, been more help in the past. So um, let's see, uh, let's switch gears. Uh, and and I'll, I have a presentation here and I call it triggering. And my hope is to get you thinking about how we can be more successful in understanding why fish put our fly in their mouth and those senses that they use and how we can avoid tripping over the warning signs to the fish. So let's kind of get right into it and we'll see if this works. So, so let, let's first consider why do fish put our fly in their mouth? And most, when we think about this, most people think of it's to eat it. And, and that's true, right? Um, and so here's a classic uh, video. This is from Barry Beck. And uh, it's showing the fish searching. And he's searching for food, but look at what he's doing. He's sorting out the junk conveyor. He's sorting out things that indicate to him that's food. So what's he looking for? That's what we're gonna call a trigger. So let's, uh, let's I'm gonna introduce some concepts. One of these is, is I'm gonna is a is a psychological term called selective attention. And it's a process that we as individuals use to focus on a particular thing. It's like how we hit a baseball. There's we concentrate on the baseball. We don't see the little kid throwing his popcorn in the background. We're looking for the baseball and how that's moving. So this is selective attention is, is, is the brain's ability to enhance the relevant signals and, and focus on, only on those. And, and so these relevant signals are another term we can think of as triggers. So one, th one thing that's obvious, and you get this from like a three-year-old kid or a four-year-old kid, right? They look at that fly and every four-year-old kid sees there's a big hook sticking out of its butt, okay? Why don't the fish notice that? It's because they're focused on what they're looking for, yes? Okay, so 
in the fish's world, reminder <laughs> that everything goes with the flow. So the currents, they bring the food, but then on occasion, they, our fly gets delivered and it doesn't go with the flow. So they're not like smart and they go, oh, that's Kirk, he's throwing that fly again. No, that they're just going, food goes this way. I don't know what that was, but it wasn't food. Yes? Okay. Except there's certain food that doesn't go with the flow. Like, of course, this uh, bait fish. By the way, paid lots of money for these uh, cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> so let's consider a hatching bug. So you just saw a nymph swimming to the surface. Now it's crawling out of its nymphal shuck. It's kind of the coolest thing for fly fishers to watch the process, okay? But what is it that causes the trout to, to see that it's food? What is the trigger that says, oh, that's food, that's not a leaf? And we can see lots of the, we have a swimming motion of this, this is a swimming uh, mayfly nymph. Then of course we see the, the, the different flashes and bubbles as nymphal shock of, uh, is shed. So again, just thinking about triggers. Reminder that we need to consider that fish see differently than we do. The optics. So we have read and thought about this cone of vision. So as the fish moves closer to the surface, its ability to see out through the surface is a smaller window. Yes. But realize that a fish lives in a hall of mirrors, okay? The surface is a mirror. So this mirror, they've learned how to live in the hall of mirrors. And they realize that the bug dimples the mirror and creates points of light. So it looks different. They see food coming from flashes of light. Okay. And those reflections get amplified. Then, of course, underneath that mirror, they can see everything. And the bottom is reflected in the mirror, yes? So again, I'm trying to get you to think, what is it that they see? How are they seeing it different? What are they looking for? But let's consider why else do fish put things in their mouth? It isn't just to eat it, okay. Here's the obvious thing, right? Back to the four-year-old kid. Fish don't have hands. So they suck things in their mouth all the time. Why are they doing that? They're doing it to investigate it further, right? There, is it food? Does it taste like food? It's weird. I don't know what it is. I'm going to put it in my mouth. I'm going to see what it feels like. Okay, if it feels and tastes like food, goes down the hatch. If it doesn't, they spit it out. If you've watched fish, you can watch them do this all the time. Okay, so maybe that's why they take my flies. They're going, what is that garbage? And then they're, okay. And realize in fast water, when things are moving by, if they want to, ask the question is, could that be food? They'll grab it, right? So that by grabbing it, it's their op only option because it's gonna get zooming by. So think about why does the mop catch tons of fish, okay? Why is that? Well, think about it, is, is the mop, th this one is is the bright chartreuse, right? And But it also feels like food and it moves like food. So in, in fly fishing, um, we, we separate our flies out by a term we call 
naturals like it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we got naturals and attractors. Naturals are, are flies that we say imitate what the fish are eating. Of course, nobody's ever interviewed a fish. <laughs> but, but the patterns often differ in the ways they emphasize a trigger. My favorite dry fly is a parachute. It sits low, which I think is an important part of it, its effectiveness. Um, because the fish are looking for that, that dimple in the surface. But then we call attractors, and, and we, we confuse ourselves. Not only do we confuse beginners with this, but we, we confuse ourselves sometimes. Because the attractors, are some look like generic food. Some like overemphasize a, a trigger. But some just look like something crazy, right? And, and trigger this closer look uh, investigation. Now, let's move to a little bit different is, is why for trout and salmon, when there's an egg in the water, instinctively trout and salmon will put the egg in their mouth. Do people know that? That's why. And, and so a steelhead is programmed if that egg is from their nest, they will take the egg and put it back in their nest. If it's not their egg, they crush it. If there is salmon, they spit it out. If there is steelhead, they eat it. It's instinct, okay? They're not pr particularly hungry. They're programmed to kill the other eggs and save their own, believe it or not. It's, genocide. <laughs> it, it's weird. <clears throat> Another weird thing about fish programming, and I don't know why God did this, okay? But, but I've witnessed this, is if a fish is acting weird, they're, they're, they've been attacked and wounded, or they're, they're sick or injured, You'll, you'll see these fish. It's, it's like a kumbaya world. Everybody's all happy. And as soon as the, the sick one shows up, the fish will get eaten almost like that. Okay? Why is this? It's part of the fish's uh, instincts that they eat fish that are dying. Okay? They're programmed to do that. So... Think about this when, we, when we're fishing our clouds or minnow. We're, we're not trying to make that minnow look like it's a happy swimmer. We're trying to trigger this instinct that, oh, he's a bad swimmer. They're having a bad day. And they trigger this, this instinct to strike. It's like the, like the weak gazelle. It is exactly <laughs> like that. Now, there's other examples where uh, brow trout is, uh, are, are famous for this, is, is if a little fish gets in the brown trout's uh, personal space, okay, that thing is getting chased the hell out of there. And they'll often nip its tail, okay? And they're not necessarily looking for a meal. They're just telling me, get the hell away from my space, right? But, well, we'll uh, fish big streamers, and, and we'll see the fish roll or slash on our fly and nip it. They'll grab it, okay? That's why we put a trail hook on a brown trout, is, is to take advantage. They're not necessarily trying to eat that baby. They're just trying to get them away. Oh, good. What's the body on that fly? Oh, this is a game changer. That's uh, uh, the yeah, it's a plain chocolate material. Um, I, it's not coming. Yeah, that's game changer. Um, some other reasons uh, that fish attack a fly 
are a terri- that that are similar to the brown trout territorialism, but in the case of bass, okay, and in all cichlids, okay, they protect their nest. So if you're smallmouth fishing, and anything comes near that nest, in smallmouth and all cichlids, the male watches over the nest, and that male smallmouth is going to come out and get whatever gets too close okay he's guarding the nest and it's he's gonna if you watch this and you watch behavior um if there's a lot of fishing pressure and those fish have been caught off that nest the fish will literally go you can drop your your fly or lure right in the middle of the nest the smallmouth will come over grab the lure fly, take it to the perimeter, and drop it, okay? And and all cichlids will do this, okay? And and so, by the way, you can catch them. They put it in their mouth, sit, okay. Okay, Um, a couple other aspects of instincts. I call this the pack attack. And you probably have witnessed this if you fish for a while. If you ever get in a situation where there's a race, okay? If you got several fly uh, fish chasing your fly, the fastest one and the quickest one is going to get your fly. But you can rest assured if you've got a pack attack, somebody's going to get your fly. This, once they, once they start the race, is every, all other in- inhibitions are gone, right? Somebody's going to get that fly. And so it's, it's helpful when we think about this, is we ever get in a situation, you're watching the water, and all of a sudden you got two fish in there, you're you are suddenly in an amazing opportunity. Now, here's uh, what what I would recommend is that you make the the race more exciting, speed up your retreat, right? And if they miss the fly, I always, when, when I set, I lock down and I never leave go because you recast, and, and that's going to land right where the fish grabbed it. You might want to shoot just a little bit of line, set it, and, and the, if those chasers are still there, they're going to grab. Um, now, in smallmouth world, uh, if you get into uh, chasing conditions, you're just going to have a great day, um, and it's an epic day on the river. Now, uh, let me talk about... an. One last phenomena. You've seen this situation. It happens a lot with smallmouth, but a lot of other species. You've got a hooked fish, and it's trailed by another, maybe a couple. This happens a lot with bass. What are they doing? Well, those, those pistols, are. they see the food hanging out its mouth. They go, oh. He doesn't have a very good grip on that bait fish. It's going to fall out. They're trailing to steal the fly. They're waiting for it to drop out of his mouth, and they're going to nab it. Okay? So this is a really interesting situation. Is If if you're on my boat and we've got a thief, okay, the second person... You want to get that fly right behind that fish as as quick as you can. As soon as you notice it, it's a great opportunity, and all you have to do is drop it in the water. Boom. Okay. And also, this is another reason. If if you are fighting a fish and you lose the fish, don't get all discouraged. Save that for another time. Get that fly back where you lost it get it there now and more often than not that trailer is hanging around there and you got him okay 
office <laughs> dropping in and out there. He sent me an email. He's having a tough day, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and feel for you, Paul. Hey, Paul. <laughs> Well, let's, uh, let's talk about some other ways beyond seeing that fish trigger. And we don't think about this as much as we should. It's their, their lateral line is the fish's radar. They feel with their lateral line. That's why they can eat when it's muddy, okay? And at night, they feed by feeling... They can feel the push. So if there is someone in the neighborhood, they can feel them, okay? If there's vibrations, they can feel it. Troubled bait fish, troubled fish give off characteristic vibrations that fish feel. They can feel that with their lateral line. That is way more important than we than I often think about, but our, our, our gear buddies, they, they're using their jitterbugs and their maps and, and their buzz baits to trigger the lateral line all the time. And our musky fishing buddies realize that muskies can feel fish from a uh, hundred yards away, even more. So, there's a lot of flies that are designed to push water. Um, this is, uh, this is a, a Gallup's dungeon. Um, lots of flies designed to push water and move water. And there's flies designed to induce vibration. So even the game changer, that movement, and the wiggle lips induce vibration and movement. Some people think of the game changer as the key is... It's a visual thing, but I like you to think about it could be as a vibrational thing. And so if you read the Game Changer, Blaine Chocolate's book, I forget, I, I wrote a chapter for the book that got reduced to two pages. <laughs> and so part of that was the physics of fly motion, but part of that is this whole triggering. And I try to make the point there that it might not just be the movement of the game changer, but it's the vibration signature that could be critical to its effectiveness. Realize that fish can hear way better than us, that, that, that sound is five times faster in water. And you probably know this, you go in the bottom of the pool and somebody like whacks the side and it was like really loud. And, and so it's often the trigger for food. So when a cicada drops in the water or beetles drop in the water or hoppers, fish hear that and they react to it. It's the dinner bell. It's the trigger. Bait fish splash, crayfish. You, you know that a crayfish went snap. It makes a snapping motion that's a loud click when its tail flicks back and forth. So we think about our, our friends that, that are using jigs. When that thing whacks a rock, sounds just like a crawfish, okay? So, huh, I know that's the same thing, same thing. Um, so we, 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 we thought it a little bit about what indicates food visually, what does it look like, where does it go, okay? What are they looking for? And then we talked about other ways they can sense uh, food, lateral line, they can feel it, okay? Now, realize this is the same way that fish assess danger. So, so yeah, they got food, but those same senses are really important for us to consider about danger. What do I mean by that is, is the, our fish, are, they don't like to be caught, by the way. They don't like to be caught. Uh, they want to avoid predators. They really don't like ospreys and eagles. So there, these 
cues become critical to their survival. And that the clearer the water, the stiller it is, the, 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 the stronger the light conditions, and the more predators around, the more sensitive they are to these kind of things. So if they see you coming, we the trout fish kind of, we understand it's important to be out of sight, out of mind. We, we know that we want to avoid being in the fish's cone of vision. And we know that if, if, the, if your feet are moving and it's underneath the surface of the water, that fish generally aren't freaked out by that, but you splash the water, that can really freak out a fish. And when our fly line lands on the water, do you understand it's just like lightning going off to that fish? You just broke the mirror. So they're looking up, it's a mirror, and it's just like it got shattered. It, if you're, you know, wanna have fun sometime, get the snorkel on, have your buddy throw, and you will see it really makes a commotion. So yeah, we get kind of uh, snobby about using a lighter weight line and longer leaders. But what are we doing is we're trying to avoid the danger trigger. And we realize the first cast in is the most important cast because we've thrown the danger sign in along with the food sign. We can't do it any other way, right? So when we throw that fly line in, we're gonna throw in the lightning storm, but we're gonna throw in a chunk of food. Even a fly line in the air as you're casting, I've had it and seen it where just that it swoops over them and yeah. they probably think it's a bird or something. But yeah, you know, it's good. The motion of something going over their heads and <laughs> poof. And, and all you have to do is witness your buddy getting eaten by an osprey once and you're, you're <laughs> kind of a little more careful. Blue yeah. <laughs> Well, also the fly line gets water on it, and if you put it in the same place, you've got water spray all over. There you go. Boom. Is it you? You throw that water spray every time that 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 cast ends. It's just like a shower. Okay. So we we do know that the first cast matters the most, but do you think about it's because you freak the fish out? Okay, by throwing something in there. And we, we know that it'll get worse when the sunnier the day. So, you know they can hear you coming. And this is way, way more important in bass fishing than most people realize, because we kind of get conditioned in this. So a trout, you gotta be careful, but bass, you don't. I really like to bass fish, and I really like to catch big fish. And, the best situations for, for going out for big fish is nobody around. And you gotta be super duper stealthy. And you gotta be really slow and careful. And you can see really big fish. But, you know, well, if there's people around, I, I, I'll watch those same fish and, and they won't, they'll, they'll disappear. They react really quickly. Uh, and smallmouth are, are way more sensitive to this than most people think. Okay, they can feel your presence, uh, the pressure waves from waiting. And if you got a boat, that hull is pushing water. Yeah, the hull is slapping water. They can hear it. Yeah, you jump down off the deck and then onto the next deck. Yeah. It, it's just like an M80 going off. Aluminum hull canoes. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Bang. So let's mm -hmm. let's think about multiple triggers. This, um, so sometimes all you have to do is 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 um, put some trigger out there and the fish crush it. So I don't know. This is a great time for a Creel X fly. You just, face full of flash, you know? And man, they just hammer the flash. They, they, they're they all pissed off and they'll, they'll hammer that Creel X. It's a reaction strike day. And those are way, way fun, right? Sometimes it's a plop, 
so if there are cicadas, all they have to do is hear that thing going off. You, the, the, the Chuck Craft cork bugs, they, they're like a baseball coming down. Those things, they weigh 35 to 50 grains. You drop that thing on the water, it's called kerplunk. Those fish hear it, they react to it, and, and that's a reaction strike. But more often than not, that's not the way the fish feed, okay? More often than not, you, they get attracted by one trigger, and there, there's others that are required to seal the deal, okay? And so um, let's talk about the attractor closer. This is, is and, and Blaine talks about this, um, is you, you need the flash to get the fish's attention, but you need another, there's times when you need another one to seal the deal. And, and in clear water, Blaine is committed to the whole concept of his game changer. That's when you've got to have a realistic silhouette. And our Rapala friends, right? The, when you look at that Rapala in the water, it looks like a fish. It really looks like a fish. Even the four-year-old go, well, that's a fish. Well, okay, so, so they're attracted by this motion, and then that, that, that second trigger seals the deal. So um, one, there's a lot of different ways this can affect our fly fishing, and, and let me just remind you that a two-fly rig is sometimes better than either single fly fishing it. And that's because of this attractor closer thing. And so in, in the case of, of two nymphs, I'll often have something that's bright and something that's natural, okay? You might have a lightning bug and you have a Harris ear, something like that. Uh, there's a lot of folks that'll, they'll, they'll trail a, a big streamer with a little guy, okay? And, and the fish will react on that big thing and then they'll see a little one and, and they'll commit. Um, okay, cool. Am I going too fast? No, okay, okay. I got a question for you. Yeah, go. We talked about the practice, and maybe you're going to talk about this, but we talked about putting a, a trigger on the fly and tie them. Yes. Might be a, a butt, little butt on it. it yeah. Be a, you know, like a Frenchie that's got a little collar on it or whatever. Right. You going to talk about that, or is that just assumed in all of this? Now, I'm not going to go into specifics. This talk is more to help us to think about it in a more holistic way. Okay. Um, it's get you thinking. My my goal, my I will be successful if you're still thinking about this in a couple of weeks. Okay. So here's a big one is really important for us is the impact of fishing pressure. And so fish don't like to be caught. Um, and, and as they're caught, they learn. This is why I like to go out and catch those stockies on the Coahuacan. I'm doing my service to educate them. <laughs> well, well done. And, and, and before I release, we have a little talk. You know, in the net. Say, you didn't like this, did you? So what'd you learn? <laughs> but they do. That is, is so fish will tend to avoid flies and tactics that have caught them before. And as fish get more and more pressure as they get caught they're they're going to go away from their natural check it out i don't have hands i'm going to suck this thing in and see if it's food uh they're going to start focusing on triggers that signal food and so we know like in the delaware river that those fish can get really snarky right and, and what are they doing is they're really hyper selective because they, they're, they're not going to tend to eat a fly they've eaten before. And they're going to tend on 
eating mayflies are going to be really careful about how they re eat the naturals. That might be a color that they trigger on, or they're waiting for commitment. There was, there was a moment on, I was down in Marsh Creek on Pine Creek. Um, that's closer for us than probably you guys. But uh, it's a real slow pool in there. And the brown drakes were coming off. It was like phenomenal, these big mayflies. And I'm watching this trout feed. And he'd tip up, and he'd watch that fly. And when the wing would move, he'd eat it. But he wouldn't eat it unless the wing moved. So I'm going, oh. <laughs> oh, what am I going to do about that? Well, of course, I moved to flying. I got him. We had a little talk in the net, let him go. <laughs> yeah. I just want to point out, it's often said like out west, when you fish a uh, terrestrial grasshopper, beetles, whatever, you put one float over the fly and uh, over the fish and the fish comes up to look at it and doesn't take it. Do not cast the same fly again. Yeah. Yeah. Switch the fly. He's, he's learned something. Oh, yeah. I, there was a really poignant moment for, for me learning on the Missouri River. There was this run, and it was really kind of a brisk run. And I'd put hoppers through that. I had everything I had. And I couldn't move a fish. Natural hopper comes in, and it's floating down the river. It's, it's like freaked out. It's moving all around. Boom. That thing get eaten like that. There you go. My flies did not look like that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> technology. Yeah, yeah. I've thought about it. I've, I thought about it. I thought how how how, how can you... so, so this is really important. Uh, it in fly fishing, our lures have certain advantages that gear guys can't do. And one of the things our lures can do is they can move at rest, okay? That's why we use bunny and marabou and things like that. And it's often a trigger. So they're, you understand is they don't wanna see it going like this. They just wanna see it twitch, right? So how do we do that? Well, sometimes we use subtle materials that move easily in the water. But me, I'm thinking I want to have some kind of material. If it gets, if it gets wet, it starts stretching and it moves the fly around. Yeah. Okay. Nano technology. Yeah, there you go. So sometimes you just move. You know, that's how you have a certain size grasshopper. Use this size rubber legs. Yes. And uh, Jim McGraw came up with. Of course, he names his old converted. So he named his fly <laughs> long, thin, tan legs. <laughs> and that's what we did is we went to the fly shops and we found the rubber legs that were designed for really small flies. Now, the problem is when you tie them on a grasshopper, they get all, they tangle up very easily. So a lot of people don't like it because then it gets tangled. Oh, yeah, yeah. But boy, you put that on the water. Yeah. So it's good trade, right? Oh, yeah. So you'll have to undo the fouling every right. once in a while? Right. Okay. You catch a hell of a lot more fish. There you go. Yeah. Don't tell Jim <laughs> Okay. So fishing pressure. Let's talk. Now, notice I, I slipped one in on us here. Is As I said, bigger fish. This is all about learning, right? These fish are learning. So the... The, the more pressure, the more fishermen, the more they're gonna learn. The older they get, the more the opportunity they have to learn. So if we're really liking to catch the bigger ones, we gotta be really on our game, right? That means we've gotta avoid sending the danger signals and be really mindful of thinking about what is it it's looking for. Because the more they're pressured, the more they're, they're not going to chase, they're not going to be aggressive, but they will trigger. It is, they eat. They don't starve to death, right? 
So how should this affect our fishing? So, yeah, go ahead. Do you know, has anyone determined the long-term versus short-term memory of a trout? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Well, that's, that's yeah. a question. The older they are, they, they have a longer memory. <laughs> That's assuming they're us, what was right? That well, that could, <laughs> <laughs> the, the same question could be asked about fishermen. Right. Yeah. But, but my, my point is, is that, you know, there's a fishing season and then there's the next year. No. So do they relearn all over again in the springtime? Is it critical that you fish earlier before they've relearned? Do they remember from the year before? Give them a test. Well, this, so we do give them a test. We have empirical evidence, right? Is is we we all know that you go into Delaware, you you're in there early spring. Um, your your chances are way better than in August, right? You, the same is true in Montana. If they haven't seen it for a while, your chances are way better. Now I don't know that they forget that it's. Do they need a reminder? I don't know. Become but become less wary. Right? Just become less wary. They, they, yeah, yeah. They're hungrier. Hungrier in the early season. They, 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 that's probably all true, right? Yeah, that's probably all true. But but I do think the lack of pressure, they, they, if people aren't around, these trip, uh, the, I love the trip fishing. Uh, I haven't stopped fishing since the fall, right? Um, yeah, this. This year I got walking pneumonia because I was out there with the 21 year old. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, the pressure goes down. Those fish get a lot less spooky and they got a lot easier to catch. So um, I, I think it's funny. I, I'll, I'll post up on our club's Facebook page. I, Post a picture of me and a fish, and and inevitably the first question is, well, what fly did you catch them on? You know, well, it's kind of a nice kind of break the ice kind of question, you know, but it's the wrong question, right? It's not the fly. It's everything. It's how you fish it. It's, it's what you were doing when you were fishing it. All those things work in a, to solve the puzzle. It's not the fly. I had a fly, uh, the shimmering minnow was kicking butt up in smallmouth in Maine for me. And I had, I'm not even, I don't even want to say, right? more than 100 fish day, two of them. And I gave, the fly to one of the other guys in camp, fly fisher. He used it. He came home with five. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's the moral of the story is after you train the fish, you hand it off to the next guy. <laughs> <laughs> Here, try this fly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm done with this. <laughs> that's good. That's good. So you missed five, right? <laughs> I had to, just a little story. I had the same thing in Iwaka. You know, I went out with an old buddy and, and he was upstream. You take this spot. It's the best spot on the Iwaka I know. Then I went down below him, you know, like, so I was down below him. I was catching all the fish, you know, one fish brown after another. And he's up there, nothing, nothing. Not, and I even gave him the same fly. <laughs> so I says, oh, I finally said, okay. You come down here. I've been catching one after another. I'll go up with you. <laughs> yeah. So I went up there, catching one after another. He's down where I was. You know, so like you say, there's a lot of factors. Remember, you're still alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, the worst thing you can do is give him your hot spot. Right. <laughs> well, it, so what, let's reverse this, though. It, it's what I'm submitting to you is there's been times when I get my, my ass kicked out there. Right, and you zero out, and I'll come home. Oh, he's using this all the flies and all that stuff, and I get all kind of bent out of shape. But in my best days, I kind of take a moment to learn, right? 
and then and to listen and to learn. And then I realized that that, that day, my the kid that I've been mentoring since he's six kicked my butt. Well, why did he do that? How can I learn from that? What was he doing differently? And and so what I'm 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 trying to do in this talk is get us to think about. Yeah, okay, my favorite fly didn't didn't perform. Okay, let's let's expand that and think about why. And and think about things that we can change the next time. Uh, because there's certain situations where, yeah, I love it as much as anybody else. You get an epic situation they're chasing and you can throw a rag out there and that's it's just fun. But but we all know that the real challenge in fly fishing is, is when the situation is tough, you can go out there and still catch fish. And in and, and, and doing this, I'm trying to get us to think deeper about, well, let's think about what it was the fish were looking at because they, they weren't buying what we were selling, okay? But it's not just a fly. It's other things that we could do differently, how we present a fly, where they were at at the time, and maybe we might have triggered the danger on them. And, and so let me share a, a few observations. This is from our fly fishing class. Oh, I always ask, you know, what's, what's the most important thing to catching fish? And uh, all, all, all the students say, oh, yeah, they suggest this and that. And I remind them the number one most important thing to catching a fish is your fly is in the water, okay? Because we've all been smoked by that, you know, a little kid that comes in there and with the old pole and psh, he's got the big fish, right? But uh, for trout, it's my opinion that the most important thing is your fly is where they're feeding in the water column. And I think it's got to act like the fly, but uh, uh, the, the, the thing they're eating. But of course, if you get the whole match, it's the best, right? But this would be Kirk's parade for trap. Um, oh, I can't do it. Your computer doesn't <laughs> advance it. But for larger trout, we need to, in pressured conditions, we need to get all those in the zone, right? And they start getting selective on details. So that's why our buddies at uh, in the West Branch get all like wound around their axle about, oh, you gotta have CDC wing and, you know, it's gotta have a, a trailing shuck and it's gotta be Darlon orange, right? Okay, and guess what? Unique flies, those West Branch fish, they tend not to take the fly they've been caught on. So if you're fishing, you know, the parachute atoms and everybody else is fishing the parachute atoms, my belief is you'd be way better off to use your wacky creation because it looks different. Another story, I was down there, I took uh, one of the Corning people from Corning, Japan, he's a fly fisher, and I fished in Japan with him, and he's fished over here a number of times. And so he wanted to catch brown trout on dry fly. That was the objective. He came over in July. <laughs> so I, I, I I like coached him. I said, you know, Saramora sounds like impossible. But I said, we'll try. I said, take the drift boat down. Well, that was the summer when they poked the hole in the dam, right? And they were flowing 1500 CFS and fish, those fish were eating dry flies all freaking day. <laughs> <laughs> so we hadn't gone 100 feet and there was this big, brown trout rising under these hemlocks. So I anchor up, so I'm to see him. He had never seen a brown trout that big in his life, okay? 
they were watching this rising fish. And the guy's like freaking out. It's like he puts this little tiny weeny Japanese fly on with CDC wing thread. It was it was beautiful, but it's like okay. Well, don't you know that 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 fly went past the fish? I'm gonna oh, well. It was, you know, it went past the fish. That fish chased it down <laughs> and ate it. Oh, we landed him. We hadn't gone an hour, and he already had the biggest brown trout he'd ever seen in his life was in his net. Okay, so uh, big, big trout, really important to be stealthy. Uh, Joe, good speed. Uh, you know him, He's he was a Cortland line designer for a long time, went to Thomas and Thomas, now he's he's with Diamondback. Uh, Joe Goodspeed is a, is a fly fishing savant. He's just amazing. And he does a talk about, if you wanna catch big trout, go away from pressured areas, go to marginal water, go downstream where it's warmer, where people aren't fishing. That's where you're gonna find these big trout are gonna, keep from getting caught. Okay, let's switch gears uh, on bass. And uh, one of the fun things about bass is when it's actively feeding, it will eat anything. And so anything that's nearby where it's feeding, it'll take. So that is the funnest part about largemouth, smallmouth bass is when they're on the feed, all you got to do is get it. If they're eating on the surface, you get a fly there. The bigger the fly, the better. The color matters, and it's just plain fun, okay? And I got in a flying ant hatch on the Shemung, and I caught 100 fish on a yellow gurgler, okay? Whoa, gurgler. It's a foam fly, okay? It's huge. it's huge. It doesn't even look anything like an ant. It's yellow. <laughs> okay. They're just like, huh, looks like food. I'm in a feeding mood. Boom, eat it. However, the biggest fish or the more pressure with bass, they're going to act more like trap, that means stealth becomes way more important. Natural flies, natural presentations come way more important. That fish is the likely Pennsylvania state record largemouth bass. It estimated between 11 and 13 pounds, okay? Low light conditions, stealth bomber, olive, end of day, Everybody's gone, I get, and, it, and I landed that fish. Now, <laughs> forget all you said. <laughs> realize you, you don't need, this was to get you thinking, right? And we all know that you can catch fish and have fun without any of this. And, <laughs> okay, there it is. I tried the first time. Yeah, looks familiar. This that, is, that was done without a bobbin. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, hey. This is literally my first fly. I was 10 years old. Yeah. This is a Royal Coachman. <laughs> it is? This, this, this is 10 year old Kirk, interpretation of a Royal Coachman. That he caught the night before, right? <laughs> that caught fish. So we need to be mindful of this when we're uh, we have new folks in the sport. When they show us their royal coachman, it will catch fish. But we we choose to fly fish because it's challenging, and in and we think it's a sporting way to solve problems, and. Um, with all this knowledge and skill, I'm convinced there's times when fly fishing is the most effective, and it's always, for me, the most fun way to catch fish. So I'm believing that the more that we learn, that the, the deeper the satisfaction comes 
when we can land fish in challenging conditions. This is my personal best uh, uh, brown trout, and that's Maxwell's, <laughs> believe it or not. Maxwell's break? Yeah, 32 <laughs> inches. So this is my uh, granddaughter. So I remind you to uh, catch and release. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we could take some questions. We we okay for time? I don't know. Oh, yeah. I, I completely lost track. Oh well, it's eight thirty. <laughs> yeah. so should wrap. Soon. We've got like twenty people. So any anybody on Zoom? Uh, if you want to unmute, there it's okay to unmute sure, and yeah. ask a question. I got a question. What, what do you think is the biggest? You know, some always is. Is to get out there the dead darkest night, mm -hmm. put the big spinner out there, and you float in the dead, so it's like a dead spinner, mm -hmm. and, the, and the fish are a whim it. You know, you think it's just because it's dark. Still, even though it's pitch dark, there's some kind of silhouette. Yeah, I do. I think it's they can they see a silhouette because if you look up, you know that the bright sky. I think that that spinner fishing is that way. No <laughs> yeah, I think it's a silhouette, but but you know, I you it just seem so pitch dark. You wouldn't think there would be, but there must be some silhouette. There must be something. Um, yeah, and I fished in some really dark conditions, and you know, you get on the green green Drake uh, spinner fall, which is a different issue. Then you got a million naturals, and you're flying. How the hell are they going to find that? Um, <laughs> But yeah, that's what I think of, but I don't know. Yeah. Hey, Kirk, uh, what's the, uh, could you talk a little bit about FFI and what that organization is versus PU and um, oh, sure. Of, uh, FFI is and. Sure, I'll do that. Okay. Um, so I'm a life member of both TU and FFI. And I've been a member of both since uh, my teenage years, okay? So I'm, I'm a believer. Um, Trend Unlimited is, is an organization dedicated to preservation of cold water fisheries, right? And so that brings us all together. We're not only fly fishers, but uh, we're, we, we welcome, you don't have to be a, a, a fisher to be a TU member. All you have to do is be willing to join our cause in preserving cold water fisheries. That's our gig. Um, Fly Fishers International is an organization dedicated to advancing the sport of fly fishing. Okay. So all fish, all waters. Um, and and uh, its origins, uh, so TU started in the late 50s, right, in Michigan, Grayling, I think. Yeah. And, um, and it was started as a cold waters fishery organization. FFF, Federation of Fly Fishers, started by Lee Wolf and some others in the 60s, uh, was an effort to join together independent fly fishing clubs all around the country. There's these legacy fly fishing clubs like in New York City, Portland, Oregon, all through the West. They tend to be old boy clubs, okay? They're hundreds of years old, you wear ties. And I don't know. Uh, but, but it was a way to join them together. Okay, and so the idea is that they could do more for the sport by joining together. Um, TU is what now 300,000 members, FFI is about 12. So it's a much smaller organization. Um, and uh, the things that FFI is known for is their casting instructor certification. So um, they have methods to help people to common language in teaching fly fishing and helping uh, folks who want to be casting instructors be better. So like my club has one certified 
casting instructor. There's a club down in uh, Franklin, Pennsylvania that has five. Um, That's a pretty arduous uh, exam too, right? To get that certification. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, and and we could have, if Kirkwood King, I, I, I think I would help people become casting uh, instructors in a different way, but I'm not the king. Uh, you discussed that with respect to their fly fishing, uh, fly tying certification, bronze, uh, silver, gold thing too. Yeah, so the the um, they they also have a fly tying uh, group, and their mission is to encourage fly tying. And so recently. Uh, they have this skills challenge that you just described. There's some similar thing in casting. And that the idea is that people who are learning fly tying, this is like a tool to help them kind of have fun and, and learn. Um, Kirkwood King, that's, I, I do something different to encourage people fly tying, but that's part of the, the role. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a really exceptional, by the way, the website has a really excep exceptional learning center that's been uh, a big focus for the current CEO. Um, and so the uh, videos and materials on fly fishing education are really extraordinary. Um, and there's materials like for your fly fishing school that you might find helpful. Oh, okay. yeah. and, 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 and certainly I get asked all the time, I'm new to fly fishing, how do I do this? I'm new to tying. Uh, extraordinary, uh, helpful materials out there on the FFI website. Um, really big push recently is uh, women in fly fishing. And it's got, in FFI world, it's called Women Connects. Uh, TU has an, a, a, a women's program as well. And in, in New York is where we're working together. Mm -hmm. And um, and so uh, that's actually going really, really well. Um, to, to, to extend a welcome to women that join our sport. And uh, it's the biggest demographic in, in, in growth in fly fishing is women in, in fly fishing right now. Thank you, Mimi. <laughs> right. <laughs> you doubled our usual. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. To change the pace a little. When you think back to when you were very young. Uh, how did you gain an interest in fishing? What was it that started this here, to become this long, or a lifelong hobby? At what stage did you go to before you became a fly fisher? That's a great question. So. I've fished since I can remember. My grandfather took me out fishing. My dad took me out fishing, worm and hook. I don't remember a time when I couldn't, didn't fish. Um, and I, there's something about the intrigue of, there's something underneath the water and I can get them. And that has just never left me. Um, for me and my, I, I was in Scouts. And my, I was in Cub Scouts when I was 10 years old. And they, on a Boys Life magazine, they published a uh, article and as a picture article, I still have it on how to tie a Royal Coachman. And they had all this vice and all that stuff and all these fancy feathers. I was a 10 year old kid, you know, it's so, so, I had a little machinist vice and uh, I, you saw my fly, my dad hunted so I could, and, and I took that thing out and I caught fish with it. And back in the sixties, you know, there, there was what, maybe, maybe five or 10 books on fly fishing that came out every year and we all wait. You know, and I bought every one of them in the, the book club because, you know, you had to buy five. And Stacked old books. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And Herder's, and Herder's Catalog. Oh, yeah, the Herder's Catalog. Oh, that, that gets got a lot of reading time in the toilet on you know, that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Too much information. Right? Yeah. <laughs> no, but, but 
I don't know why it's it's the intrigue. And uh, I also share with you that uh, my Eagle Scout project was uh, restoring a stream that had been damaged. I, I grew up in Western Pennsylvania. Um, so I worked in partnership with the uh, Arrowhead chapter at TU in, in my hometown. And we worked together to restore a stream that had been damaged by acid mine. And the mine had acid mine drainage. Yeah. And the, the mine had been sealed up. And so we did water testing for like a freaking year to certify that, you know, they got it. Then we built uh, stream deflectors in a section of the stream to improve it. And I think we put 14 of them in. And, and that, that was my Eagle project. And unfortunately, like two years after we completed the project, the, the, the containment burst and, oh. and it ruined the stream again. So, but, so I'm a, I've been in the, as part of the mission for a long time. <laughs> yeah. All right. Anyone online have any questions or? No, there's some. Thank you. Oh, okay. Cool. Kirk, you said that your, your, some of your favorite dry flies are uh, parachutes. Yes. And I remember we went through this whole thing with the missing link. Yes. Quantities. Oh, the missing link is an incredible fly. Uh, but you think the trigger is a large part of that uh, antron that's down there is like little wiggly legs? Is that? I think that the, um, so that uses Zelon. Oh, we got yeah. some people leaving. Uh, so it uses Zeon and and I think it's the reflection on the surface or maybe even below it that's critical because that missing link uh, sits down in the surface film similar to a parachute uh, but it's got more flash in in the surface film um, and that would be my first offering to you uh, in response, but I probably I should think about that more. You ever used a, a, a terra rab fly? I'll, I'll send it. Okay. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you for having me. Okay, thank you, Kirk. It was great. Um, no, it's uh, very happy with our. Yeah, I think we had close to 30 people all together, which is, um, I think, our biggest crowd of the year. So, okay, thank you. Um, and thank you for well yeah. those of you who volunteered. Okay, we got, I think, a, a good crew. All right, uh, everyone online, uh, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, it was a really great evening and great to get back together again, see folks for the first time in two years. And um, if you can, so we'll see you in, uh, in May and June and everything. Okay, we got to close down, and, um, but uh, stay tuned, folks, and um, send us any questions you have. If I, if I come to your thing on May 14th, it will be the flies leading the big land fair. No, I mean, I to okay, you have to stop. Let's see, we got a number of chats here. Uh, let's read some of those off. Okay, John says, thanks, Kirk, and thanks to Canada Agua TU for opening Zoom to friends. This was great. Thanks, Kirk. Great presentation. Thank you, Kirk. Thank you, Phil, for showing up. Huh? That was my cousin. No, oh, really, Rick. Uh, he's in Michigan. Okay, great. Your cousin, if you can. <laughs> All right. <laughs> We're going to turn the recording off now, and um, there we go.